The title of this lecture, as you can see, is Linen and Wool, Tactics for Working with Non-Christians. And I thought I would have some fun and open with a picture of the kinds of people that I have had experience to work with within the menswear trade industry. Maybe some of you can relate to these kinds of folks, these customers. I've worked with non-Christians in the men's garment industry for more than 30 years. At 23 years old, I began an apprenticeship as a window dresser, mainly for the men's window and some women's fashion industry. At that time, even up until this present day, at least in the big cities, window displays were a major portion of the store's advertising, and I would decorate the windows according to certain themes, depending on the seasons. I did mostly men's windows, but occasionally I would do a woman's window as well, and it was during this time that I was able to hone my skills, that by the time I was 25, I was able to begin my own business, servicing stores on Long Island, New York, New York City, upstate New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. My clients ranged from those in the clothing industry to hard goods stores such as stationery stores, hardware stores, toy stores, jewelry stores, even eyeglass stores. If the store had a window that you could put a display in of any kind, that store was fair game, whether it stood alone or in a mall, so you have hard goods stores, clothing stores, all kinds of things. My customers were mostly, at that time, business people. You know, small business owners, uh, usually family-owned folks. One of my clients here. Usually, I decorated windows for you know mom-and-pop shops, just, just local folk, moral folk. Very uh, thankful for my services, appreciative of my decorating skills. And at that time in the window decorating industry, for these mom and pop shops, I had no trouble working for them. And the atmosphere was good. The atmosphere was friendly. It was pleasant. And when I began my business, I was not yet converted. But I had a basic Protestant work ethic, which I inherited from my father. And I approached all of these opportunities like a ravenous wolf, working crazy hours, sometimes late in the morning, building my own props, my own, my own decorating things for the windows. But for me, it was all about the money. And this, of course, is me before my conversion. As things developed, I became partners with an unbeliever, which I do not recommend anyone to do. Never become partners with an unbeliever. He was 30 years my senior, and he was not a moral man, and yet he did teach me many things that I was able to, to apply to my business. And I'm still grateful for that today. He had a business savvy that I was able to quickly latch on to. However, by God's grace, that partnership didn't last. And by 1985, uh, things really began to change. I met my wife, Jane. She had her own business, her own advertising business. And when I uh, met her, she was doing drawings for the men's fashion industry trade show business. And I thought that I would do well marrying her. I get all the work for free. And of course, uh, I, um, I'm paying for it still today. <laughs> But her work was very complementary to my exhibit design business. So we were married, and very soon after that, we were both converted after that. And, and that, of course, changed everything. My, my whole worldview changed. My whole motivations changed. By then, my business opportunities had already expanded from the mom-and-pop shop. It shifted from the mom-and-pop shop to the expanded trade show exhibit industry where I would be now servicing the clients who manufactured the clothing, not the stores that purchased the clothing. And in the early 80s, that trade show business was just getting started. It was just, we were on the ground floor at that time. So my clientele shifted from the mom and pop store to the wholesale manufacturers. And this was a notable change, not only in the services that I had to provide, but in the clientele especially. With a staff of about 15, we manufactured the trade show exhibits. We shipped them 
This is the exhibit hall in Las Vegas, Nevada. We brought in our crates that we, are, we, all, we also built, began to set up the exhibits, decorated the booth with the clothing, set up the areas for salesmen, decorated the clothing, the mannequins, and so forth. And after the installation and the decorating, when the show was over, we then dismantled the booth, or booths. At one time, I had 15 exhibits at one time. That's why I needed such a crew. And then we shipped it, we packed it, we shipped it, we stored it for the next trade show. In addition to the win window display and the trade show work, I also began to expand, and I began uh, demolitioning and rebuilding uh, showrooms. So I would be involved in showroom renovations locally as well in the Empire State Building where most of my clients were in New York City and where most of the menswear trade show uh, wholesale companies were. And what is interesting about the garment industry, if you know anything about the garment industry, is that it is populated 98% by Jews. Now that dynamic provided a series of very unique opportunities for me. So whenever my Jewish clients were delinquent in their payments, which they often were, I would remind them of their Hebrew roots, their Old Testament roots. And, of course, thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him of the wages of him that is hired, shall not abide with thee oh, till the morning. And, of course, whenever I, I would quote that. In fact, I had that on my invoices because I knew what to expect. That was on the bottom of all my invoices. You know, they would, they would come and they'd look at each other and then they'd write the check. <laughs> so I would quote from Leviticus 19 and they would pay me on time for the full amount. Now, the environment of the menswear trade industry was completely different than my window dressing business. That, that industry, if you've ever been to these kinds of shows, it was a swamp of every imaginable perversion, especially when the conventions were held in places like New York City, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas. It was a Pandora's box, a hotbed for all kinds of perversions of every kind, from adultery, fornication, sodomy, corruption, money mongering, vulgarities of every conceivable kind, things you, you, could, you didn't even, couldn't even recognize they were so perverted. Union payoffs, fierce competition, a real Pandora's box of sin. And we were smack dab in the middle of it in order to make ends meet, in order to have our business function. So maintaining a biblical composure and a strict sense of biblical ethics and dealing with customer pricing, negotiations with those who many of us started to call the animals was a serious challenge. And to find a Christian within that community is a rarity. It was like finding a needle in a haystack. However, I did find some. And that was a glorious encouragement to see Christians within that community. And I was forever thankful for that because I had, I had someone to talk to in, in, the, in the mass confusion of, of a perversion. And I still keep up with some of them today. To some of them, I even became a sounding board on how to deal with certain things and in business. Some, some of them regarded me as their priest when they, they had to deal with some, some biblical ethics. I also, at that time, had to fly my crew to assist in the trade show work when we had a lot of work. And I would fly them to Los Angeles, later Las Vegas, some of which were not believers, which, of course, when you have employees which are not believers, that presents a particular challenge all of its own. And uh, here's a picture of some of my crew members here uh, with my clients. <laughs> I'm only kidding, of course. Here is a uh, here's a picture of some of my clients, and some of them still remaining friends today. Now, during that 33 years of business within that industry, I learned I learned many things, and of course, God refines you through some of those most difficult periods of your life, in those many experiences. And what He taught me, if He taught me anything, it was to trust Him, because in that environment. You couldn't really count on much. 
But you could count on God. So I was taught to trust God that everything would work out even when things seemed impossible. He was my true north. He was my constant. And I knew that as a Christian businessman, if my motives were always God-centered, Christocentric, He would bless me. He would pull me out of all of that confusion. And He would maintain my biblical composure and my ethic, my ethics, my biblical ethics, a sense of biblical ethics. Now, everyone knows this. Everyone knows Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Well, we decided to add to that. We, we, uh, me and my staff, uh, we decided to, to add to that. And, and, and we, we added this. The only thing that you can count on is that you couldn't count on anything. And yet, I was counting on God. I also learned to allow the wicked to be wicked without trying to convert them. I was not there on an evangelical mission. My business relationship was not an evangelical relationship. It was not there to convert sinners. I was there to conduct business with a Christocentric position, maintaining my Christian witness in a way that these people never knew before. That, in and of itself, I believe was evangelical enough. Now, my clients came from all over the country, but mostly from New York City, where the F word is almost a food group. It's part, it is part of every sentence, it is part of every thought, every discussion. It is used to explain everything. You couldn't explain, you couldn't have someone explain something to you without using the word. And if you don't have that intestinal, if you're dealing with these kinds of people, and you don't have that intestinal and spiritual fortitude to turn a deaf ear to that kind of language or to that kind of behavior, then you should only conduct your business with nuns. In the trade show industry, gambling, pornography, sensuality, prostitution were the norm. Solicitation by both men and women was commonplace. Sometimes, depending on the circumstance, when I would be solicited, I would use that opportunity to share the gospel or tell them just to get lost. It was all around you. You you couldn't get away from it. No way you could escape since it was within that atmosphere that I had to function. I simply had to keep my focus on my work and not be sidetracked into that cesspool of wickedness, which was a cesspool of wickedness. I can't imagine. I've been out of it now for about six years. I can't imagine what it's like now. I I don't even want to imagine. Of course, not everyone will face these kinds of challenges when working with non-Christians. And there will be times when you'll be given opportunity to evangelize. And that would be the golden nuggets of your job. Now, there are two, basically two areas of importance when working for a company, or as an entrepreneur. One, you must be skilled in your trade. You can't skimp. You must know what you're doing. You can't pull the wool over anybody's eyes. You must know what you are doing, and you must be doing it well. If you're going to charge a fee for something, for your service, then your services should be worth every dollar you charge. Be sure that your skill level is on par with your promise to deliver a product or a service. Know when you're out of your depth as far as skill level and subcontract a trustworthy person, a professional, if you're not sure of your proficiency. Otherwise, you'll again, you'll mar your witness. If you promise a thing, you cannot deliver it on time, on target with your pricing, it will mar your witness. Never overcommit. Today, sadly, I tend to stay away from service providers who say they're Christians. You know, the little fish on the truck or on the car, I stay far away from them because I've been burned by more Christians than non-Christians in my tenure, and that has to stop. Character is essential. You must maintain a continuity, not just a fit and a start, but a continuity of biblical character. Character traits are essential. Integrity, essential. You must develop a trustworthy relationship with your customer. You must be personal, not preachy, likable, not judgmental. God wants you to evangelize. He'll provide the time and the place. He'll provide the situation. It'll be evident. You'll be able to, you'll be able to do it. Be honest with your pricing. You don't set one price for rich people like I had someone do. Even in my church, an elder, and he's no longer an elder, he's no longer in the church. He would see uh, rich folk there, his price would go up. Poor folk there, price would go down. How do I charge for a fee? How do I charge for a service? I look and see what my car payment is. You have to be honest with your pricing. 
You must be proactive, not slothful, timely in delivering your product or service. Dependability is essential. Build credibility. Go the extra mile. Make sure, make sure that your ultimate goal is not the money, but the opportunity to honor God by your witness in the business world among non-Christians. And finally, and this is the kicker, use the prophets to build the kingdom, not your kingdom. That is why God has given you the opportunity to be a business person or an entrepreneur. That is how Christendom will survive. But not only survive, you're using your talents to build the kingdom. Christendom will not only survive, but it will flourish once again. Thank you very much.